Great. Thanks very much, Stu, and thanks everybody for coming today. Um, it's, it's been a really exciting time in, immunolo in immunology in the last couple of years, and uh, we're really, I think, um, on the cusp of something really exciting. So I thought it would be a really good time to take stock and maybe look back in history and see how we got to where we are, uh, which is now, I think, um, a place where we can really hope for the future. So the title of my talk is going to be The Long Road Towards Cancer Immunotherapy. Um, and, and so cancer, the term was originally coined by Hippocrates, um, Karkonos, because the, the cancer reminded him of a crab because it would, instead of behaving itself, it would spread out and, and invade the local, local tissues by spreading its claws. And of course, cancers are very hard as well, like the shell of a crab. And so cancers have been with us for a long time. And in fact, it's one of the diseases that's confronted mankind throughout history that we've really, really... Uh, being challenged by, and it's actually led to this term that it's, it's the emperor of all maladies. Um, and so if you look back, actually, even our ancestors, as back as 1.7 uh, million years ago, we've been afflicted by cancer. So um, here is a, um, a bone from an early um, human spe um, a sample, um, human early hominid, and you can see this cancer here growing like a cauliflower out of the bone, what we would probably now recognize as an osteosarcoma. So, you know, even the mummies had cancer. So here is uh, an Egyptian mummy, and this, this pharaoh had uh, cancer of the prostate, which has spread to um, his spinal cord. Um, and so this is another property of cancers that we, that's been really challenging, and that is that early on, cancers spread, and sometimes they will stay in the tissues, dormant for long periods of time, and so patients who may have been treated and think that they've been effectively treated years later relapse and then can die. So that's a real challenge to curing cancer. And the first of descriptions of cancers have not, are not very promising because, you know, going back to um, this description by Imitet, one of the earliest physicians and one of the earliest medical textbooks, there's this description that just really, you know, resonated when I saw it, which was that from the first description of breast cancer, there's this line that says, there is no treatment. So you have this very nihilistic attitude towards patients with cancer, that this is like a death sentence. And this is an attitude that persisted through the ages. So, you know, even in Roman times with Celsus, in one of the first uh, medical encyclopedias, in his description of cancers, even after surgery, even after you've cut out the cancer and a scar is formed, nonetheless the disease has returned. And again, this goes back to this idea that you can't cure cancers, you might be able to get rid of some of the local disease, but it will come back. So, one of the turning points, I think, and one that's been often overlooked, is this case of um, this gentleman here, St. Peregrine of Lasiosi, who was a, um, a very religious man and, in fact, um, would kneel down every day and pray to God. And, it, and he also had varicose veins, and as a consequence of that, he developed chronic ulcers on his leg. Now, this is really an interesting case in point because it tells us about the power of the immune system to do both harm and good. Because of the chronic ulcers, he had chronic inflammation, and over time, the ulcer turned into a cancer, what we would um, now call a Marjolin's um, ulcer. And it got so bad that they were planning to amputate his leg. So they got the local barber, and they were getting ready to amputate his leg. And that, that was a big problem for him, because you know, he really wanted to be able to kneel and pray to God. So one last time, he kneeled down to pray to God and to hope for a miracle. And what had happened was that in the intervening period, his ulcer had become infected, and that infection had turned on the immune system, which had ignored the cancer for all this time, and overnight he was miraculously cured. So this is a really exciting idea that on the one hand, yes, chronic inflammation can cause cancer, but maybe the immune system can also be switched on to get rid of the cancer. And so this is the first recorded case, I think, of spontaneous remission or regression of a cancer. And because of this miracle, um, Peregrine was made a saint. Um, and it really points to the power of the immune system. And this idea that infection might somehow switch on the immune system um, carried some sway in the 1800s with this um, surgeon, Campbell de Morgan. And now you may have heard his name because um, there are these spots that people can get um, on their skin called Campbell de Morgan spots. Um, uh, maybe different generation may recognize that Beyonce has quite a lot of these. Um, but, but Campbell de Morgan... <laughs> described also spontaneous uh, regression. And one of the things he, that he made a connection with was that a lot of the patients who had sp spontaneous regression also had a common disease at the time that was killing a lot of people, and that was um, uh, tuberculosis. So patients with cancer who happened to also have tuberculosis tended to have 
uh, or not tended to have, that may be fortuitous enough to have a spontaneous regression. And so this connection between infection and being cured of cancer started to develop. And really, it probably prematurely um, came to fruition with a guy named William Coley, a, a, a surgeon in the United States, who's now credited with being the father of immunotherapy because he also made that connection and thought, well, you know, if infections can give rise to cures, then maybe if I deliberately infected my patients with cancers, I might be able to cure them. The problem that was that he was a little bit too enthusiastic and by injecting live bacteria into his patients, he was actually, in some cases, able to achieve am amazing results with with um, eradication and cure of his patients, but quite a lot of times as well, he also was killing his patients with the bacteria. So this goes a little bit against what we're about in medicine, which is first do no harm, right? So, but this idea persists, right? And, and, and so, so then the next step he thought was maybe if we killed the bacteria and the bacteria couldn't you know, cause an infection, but whatever was in the bacteria that was turning on the, well, we didn't know about the immune system, but what was turning on the body to reject the cancer, that might work. So this became what's now known as Collies toxins. And in fact, in Europe, you can still um, be prescribed co Collies toxins for your treatments of cancers. But this was a really controversial treatment, and eventually it was banned by his superiors at the hospital. And one of the reasons why it was banned was that things just got ahead. So one of the, one of the earliest, probably effective treatments for cancer was actually immunotherapy. But what um, overtook um, immunotherapy, at least in its early incarnation, was the development of radiotherapy. So radium actually became a really effective way to kill cells that were actively dividing. And because the, radio th the radium could be, in, 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 in its early days, not so well, but could be precisely targeted almost to areas where there was cancers, then it was thought to be a much better way to treat than surgery. And then in addition to radiotherapy, because of the Second World War and the introduction of this terrible chemical warfare involving mustard gas, there were, after the second, I'm sorry, after the First World War, there was a lot of research in the United States um, defense to look at developing chemical weapons. And one of the derivatives of mustard gas was this thing called nitrogen mustard, which one of the researchers, for children, really realized could actually kill white blood cells. And this became the first chemotherapy. So nitrogen mustard was used to treat leukemias, which are cancers of white blood cells. But this also points to a big problem with both radiotherapy and chemotherapy because these are incredibly toxic things designed to kill people. Um, and we're trying to titrate the dose so that it only kills the cancer cells but not harm the patients. Um, what's been really, really um, exciting in the last few decades has the, been the rise of what's been called molecularly targeted therapy where by using genomics and genetics and finding out what is mutated in the cancers that gives them the survival advantage over other um, normal cells, we might be able to target that particular pathway and develop drugs that can only then, that only the cancer cells are vulnerable or susceptible to. And a good example of this is um, this drug here, Herceptin, uh, which is mutated in some patients with breast cancer. And so they've developed a drug that can block it. Um, and so, the idea then is that it would only um, be killing the cells that express this mutated receptor. But the problem with molecularly targeted therapies, of course, is because the cancers are mutating all the time, it's just like a bacteria or a virus. Eventually, it's going to mutate and develop a resistance. And resistance with molecular targeted therapies, unfortunately, is inevitable and, and patients eventually relapse. So, you know, against this backdrop of, you know, a long-standing period, um, we see that while mortality is starting to, to decline with some of these molecularly targeted therapies, the impact has not been that dramatic, and we're still seeing a rise in cancers. So is there hope? What we really need is a game changer, and, and one, of the, one of the things that we needed to recognize is that the immune system is incredibly powerful. So here's an example of a movie of a white blood cell called a natural killer cell in red attacking a, a cancer cell, and what's going to happen is that when it kills a cancer cell, it's going to glow red, and it's going to bleb and die and burst. So we know that there are cells in our body that are capable, perfectly capable. In fact, they were designed to kill cancer cells. They've, they've got names like natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells, just to give you a sense of what, what their purpose is. So the question is, why is, it, why is it that these cancer cells aren't being killed off? And what can we do to really invigorate the immune system, really get it going? Well, what's been tried in the past has been to provoke the response using bacteria, bacteria products, for example, like what William Colley did, um, 
uh, using his colleagues' toxins. And in fact, we still do that because in some types of bladder cancers, we use a vaccine called BCG against tuberculosis, remember, um, that we instill into the bladder, and that causes an irritation that triggers the immune system to then kill the bladder cancer cells. We can also provoke an immune response using chemicals called cytokines, which are the signals that the immune cells use to communicate with each other. When they want to re get really, go get, get re really get going, they send out these chemi chemicals to really stimulate each other, and we can actually produce them and inject them into patients. But again, this is very, very, you know, it's like a, a big um, non-specific bludgeoning. Or, and, and so the problem with these is, again, you get non-specific um, toxicity from, from activating all the immune system. We can also try to vaccinate patients against their own cancers in the way, same way that we would try to vaccinate patients against influenza um, every year. And then the other thing is that some cancers, because they're mutated, they, they may have tags that are specific to them that may allow us to specifically target them. And so there's a whole new um, era now where people have developed these sort of magic bullets, monoclonal antibodies, um, that are specifically targeting the cancer cells. Um, and so these are some of the possibilities, but if you, if, if you look at what's been happening, right, so this is Colley's toxins first developed two centuries ago. Um, there's a big lag period, and then there's all these new, what, what I consider first generation um, immunotherapies, and they have had some impact, but by and large, they haven't been really that successful. And there's, but really, you know, I think now what we're seeing is the dawning of a new era and, and the rise of the second generation. And, and so, so what is this second generation? Well, the second generation deals with this question of why is it normally the immune system isn't able to get rid of these cancers? And the reason is that these cancers are, cells are really clever and they exist in equilibrium with the immune system because you've got, you got to remember, they're trying to survive. So there's this Darwinian struggle between the cancer cells. They're constantly mutating, trying to make themselves invisible to the immune system. And immune cells, that's actually trying to find these cancer cells and eradicate them. And this is a very complex interaction between lots and lots of cells, lots and lots of um, molecular interactions. But the bottom line is that the immune system really needs a little bit of a help. And so, you know, the breakthrough really was two big breakthroughs, right? One is checkpoint inhibitors and the other one was CAR T cells, which several years ago was heralded as the breakthrough of the year. And so I'm just going to tell you quickly about how we can exploit these things, right? So normally the immune system doesn't just go around willy-nilly attacking your own cells because, of course, that's how you generate autoimmunity. So it needs to have all these checkpoints, you know, checks and balances in place so that it knows when to attack and when not to attack. And so, you know, you saw that the natural killer cell killing that tumor cell. So you can get a kill signal, but actually you actually need a second signal, right, um, to allow the cell to kill. And sometimes those sec that second signal, what's called a co-stimulatory signal, can be overwritten by a stop signal, a don't kill signal. And the problem is that the co cancer cells have gotten wind on the, of this, and they can upregulate the sort of messages that tell the immune system not to kill. So they're taking advantage of the normal checks and balances the immune system uses to keep itself in order. And so, led by um, this guy here, James Allison, there's a whole new field that's developed where, we, where people kind of say, well, if this is what's being used to hold the system, immune system back, why don't we just block it, take away this break? And so this whole new group of drugs called checkpoint inhibitors. And just to give you an example of the sort of power they, of these checkpoint inhibitors, here's a patient with metastatic melanoma who's failed all sorts of therapies, and you can see all these hot spots, all he's basically riddled with metastases. And he's been given this checkpoint inhibitor called ipilimumab, and very soon after, um, uh, so it's only what, four months later. Remember, it's America, so months are back to front. Um, it, he's been cleared of disease, um, and you know, at long-term follow-up, he, he's effectively been cured. So this is a really, really exciting time. Um, but what, one of the big questions is, you know, is it all patients with melanoma, and then is it is it just melanoma? What about other cancers? So. So one of the things that's been one of the real challenges for us now is to try and work out what, how we can convert patients who don't respond to these checkpoint inhibitors to patients who might, right, in patients with the cancers that respond. And then in the cancers that don't respond also, how we might convert them into the sort of cancers that respond. The other um, big development is, are these CAR T cells or chimeric antigen receptors. And it's kind of thought of as like how to turbocharge the immune system. Do you remember I said you need all these co-stimulatory signals in addition to the signal to kill to actually get the cells going? So what you do now is, what these people have done, these very clever people, is they've engineered, genetically engineered the cells so that it gets the kill signal plus 
those additional licensing signals. So it's got you know signal one and signal and so both um, signal one from the receptor and all the signal twos coming from all these costimetry molecules. And, and so the process involves taking these cells from the patient, genetically engineering them to express these very clever receptors and then putting them back in. And again, you can see very spectacular results. So here's um, a patient before treatment with the CAR T cells with this big cancer in his kidney. And then after treatment, you know, on the PET scan, it's completely gone. So these, are, these I think, are really exciting times. These are very, very clever people around the world working on these things. Initially, we only had one or two checkpoint inhibitors. Now the list is expanding. There's over 30 checkpoint inhibitors now. Initially, we only looked at CAR T cells for treating some of the blood cancers. Now people are expanding to look at solid tumours. I really think we're at the beginning of the dawn of a new era. And I think, you know, there was a few years ago from the United States when uh, Obama was president, Joseph Biden launched his, you know, cancer moonshot. The whole idea was that by 2020 we would eradicate cancer. Um, that may have been a little bit ambitious, but I think that ambition is actually very well grounded because I think the science is really putting us in this really amazing position now where, you know, not so long ago, cancer was a complete death sentence. Now I think we can start thinking about how we might actually um, be able to treat it and, and, and cure it. And this really, this graph I think is probably the most, most telling. So this is patient survival over time and with the advent of chemotherapy, you can prolong patient survival, but patients still inevitably die. And that's the problem we have with relapses, recurrences. That's what kills the patients. All you're doing is making patients live a little bit longer. The molecular therapies have pushed that a little bit further, but the patients haven't really been cured. What's really exciting is the immunotherapies, right? So you get this plateauing here. So these patients are the patients who are cured. For the first time, cancer doctors actually telling patients with some of these cancers that they're cured. What's going to be really exciting is that we can lift this line up so we can cure more patients. Patients with cancers at the moment who aren't responding to these types of therapies. Um, and that's really the challenge for all of us here um, at the Garvin and, and elsewhere around the world um, working in this space, is to try to lift that line up so that we can get 100% effective cure rates. So thanks very much for your time.